what I call my true north is being authentic. And so whether it's representing the Inverse brand and the attributes that you know we want to be approachable or it's in the messaging about how we can help give back time to your staff, to the Office of Finance, to CFOs, so they can focus on what matters most. That's what we have to do. And otherwise, you know, it's so easy to find the delete key. And so you have to make sure that your words are measured and your message is genuine. And hopefully it resonates with something that's on the mind of that prospective customer. For business leaders, what's the right balance between competing and caring? Welcome to Marketing Trends. I'm Jeremy Bergeron. Today's guest is Grant Johnson, the Chief Marketing Officer at Imburse, a spend optimization and management company whose mission, as Grant shares, is to humanize work. Grant talks about the importance of making human connections in marketing and how his love for both film and tennis has informed his business approach. Tune in to hear some really valuable insights about the importance of being a leader who cares. Let's get into it. Hey everybody, before we dive into this episode, we wanted to thank our partners at Salesforce. Salesforce brings marketing and engagement together. To learn more, go to salesforce.com forward slash marketing. All right, back to Jeremy. Really, I think that there's never been a better time to be in marketing because it's always been a dynamic field since I entered it. And with all the technologies and uh, evolution of various capabilities in the MarTech stack, there are just more things that you can do if you're creative and resourceful than ever before. What are you kind of most amped about right now? What are you most passionate about right now? Well, I think it's been a constant uh, you know, focus in, in my career is connecting with customers. And you know, we are trying to humanize work. And so our mission is one of the primary reasons that I joined in Burse. We want to help eliminate the time consuming and tedious tasks that get in the way of doing more important work or giving back to your community or spending more time with your family. So it's a very noble mission and we're in the spend optimization, spend management market. And so we're, we're, we're aiming to humanize work in that, from that perspective. And so that's what you know, really drives me and a lot of our executive team and staff. Awesome. And then what are you, what are you betting on in, in terms of the future trends or technology or just an approach or a strategy or anything like that that you're betting on for the future? You know, I'm betting on the smart uh, consumer, the, the smart customer that um, wants to make the best choice for their business. And if we can just present uh, uh, the facts, uh, the insights, that hopefully we can convince more of them to select Imburse as the path to automate a good portion of their business in the office of uh, finance, uh, you know, across the what we call the spend management continuum. There's a, a marketing report that Salesforce puts out every year, the state of marketing, and they interview all these CMOs and VPs across all these industries. And it's really interesting to see some of the data. One of the stats, and I just would love your perspective on this, it talks about how 72% of marketers say that meeting customer expectations is more difficult than it was a year ago, a year and change ago. How has this played out for you? And, and what is your team at Imburse doing to tackle this consistent challenge of rising customer expectations? Well, it's definitely played out. I think we've been in the consumer driven era, customer driven era for many years. And, you know, COVID, COVID just exacerbated the challenge to connect with customers. I think all of us feel, especially companies like Imburse that are getting back to meeting with customers in person, that there's no substitute for the human connection to be able to be in three dimensions, <laughs> talk to somebody, uh, relate to them on a personal level, you know, what's happened in your city, your town, your state, your family, your interests, and, uh, you know, deepen those connections that to a large extent over the past couple of years were really started through some, you know, electronic, virtual, digital medium. And so it just means that since we don't have as many opportunities, 
to connect in person, and we're slowly getting back to that. We have to be more precise uh, in how we engage with customers, more relevant in the dialogues that we have. And so one of the, what I call my true north is being authentic. And so whether it's representing the Inverse brand and the attributes that, you know, we want to be approachable and, and friendly and genuine, or it's in the messaging about how we can help give back time to your staff, to the Office of Finance, to CFOs, so they can focus on what matters most. That's what, what we have to do. And otherwise, you know, it's so easy to find the delete key, right? or to hang up on a phone call if you happen to be one of our you know, sales development reps and you get through <laughs> on the phone. And so you have to make sure that your words are measured and your message is genuine. And hopefully it resonates with something that's on the mind of that prospective customer. Mm. I love that answer, Grant. Um, I can tell this is gonna be a great one. Um, there's another, another stat around um, valuable metrics. A lot of marketing organizations have kind of changed or reprioritized metrics due to the pandemic. Has this been the case for you? If so, like what has become like the most valuable metric for you and the team in this kind of new era? Well, for us, there's not one metric. I, I would say to, if your audience likes TLAs, three dollar acronyms, you know, we have MBOs, we have KPIs, we have OKRs, but they're really just a variety of ways of measuring the impact of what you do, the marketing activities, campaigns, programs, investments that either result in uh, creating interest, ultimately turning into leads and opportunities, or don't. And so we have our finger on the pulse of everything that we do. I, you'd mentioned Salesforce, so you know we track things through Salesforce. We have other customized marketing dashboards of the what we call the leading indicators or the lagging indicators to see, hey, are we getting traction here? Are we losing traction there? Uh, where should we put more gas and fuel on something that's working? And, and you know, what do we, what do we stop? And uh, I will say that there's a little more noise in the system. We have found that uh, bots are attacking websites and, you know, trying to, you know, create false leads and other things that you have to figure out ways to filter out and you know we recently reached out to google they helped us uh, with some of the traffic issues we were facing because they'd seen that with other customers and that was great they were proactively helping us so that when we pass the lead over to sales it's not noise in the system it's actually a prospective customer mm. so for our audience grant can you describe like what imburst provides its customers and then your role as cmo there imburst is a spend optimization company and we help organizations manage everything to do with spend. So there's three major categories. It could be travel and expense, uh, where employees are traveling around the globe to meet with customers and prospects. And we help automate that process, take the pain away. We also help with uh, invoice automation, purchase orders, uh, and so AP automation is another term it's called so that it's easy to onboard vendors, uh, get early pay discounts and efficiently uh, pay, pay your invoices. And a third area that we just launched the Imburst spend offering targeted, aimed for small businesses that helps manage their spend. So it could be for indirect spend, things like SaaS subscriptions or Google pay, you know, PPC ads uh, or services. And it's all automated. It's, uh, it can be a virtual card, the Imburst card, or it can be a plastic card. It's pre-approved. You set the limits you can spend by week, by vendor, by location, and it goes straight through into the, the back-end ERP system. It just makes it easy for small businesses to enable their employees to manage spend, and they have all the visibility and control they need so they can rest assured that uh, money is being spent wisely. Hmm, I love it. And then tell us about your role as CMO there. Yeah, and as CMO, I run the global marketing organization. Uh, we have a very complex uh, uh, set of solutions. The good news is that we serve small business, medium business, large enterprises. But we also uh, market our products in you know North America and Europe and Asia Pacific. 
And so we uh, serve these various spend management, spend optimization markets and uh, various customer segments of personas within those segments. And, you know, my team works uh, as part of the go to market together with our sales and our partner ecosystem to serve our customers. Okay. So, so I was going to ask like what stage companies you're supporting, but it sounds like SMBs, medium enterprise, was it, was enterprise the sweet spot before, or has it always been really any size business? Well, over time, uh, Imburst has added to its portfolio. I think it probably had a heritage more in small, medium business. And in 2019, we, we got much, uh, deeper into the enterprise. That's the largest segment that we serve. Uh, Mid-market would be second largest small business. But I would say that small business, we're very excited. I'm very excited about Embers Spend and our ability to really come up with a unique way of serving that market. Uh, and uh, it's friction-free. It, basically, the, uh, there's no cost to sign up for automated uh, expense management. Um, and uh, you know, we even provide you know, a, a form of rebate the customers based on their spend levels. And so we make it very easy for customers to adopt the inverse spend platform. So let's chat about just your journey to becoming a CMO. I mean, let's go back in time a little bit. What what led you down this marketing path? I mean, when was the, I always ask like, when did the dance with marketing begin with you? Was it a book mentor? You know, we'll start with the beginning and then tell us how you got to be, to be CMO. Sure. For me, I was very fortunate. Right out of college, I was uh, joined a small $10 million company, relatively small compared to most of the companies I'd been at are in the hundred million to several hundred million. And I was on a rotational assignment that they were very forward thinking. So like, we're not sure what you're good at. You're a political science major. So, you know, I was in production uh, that bored me to tears. Uh, although I'm sure there's brilliant people in production then I was in the finance administration. I was interested in that. I've always had, I think, pretty good financial acumen. I've been a CMO of public companies. Um, but when I got into the sales and marketing, there was a spark there that the fact that we could talk to customers, we could motivate customers, we could engage with them in you know, trade shows or industry events. And that's where I really got excited. And ultimately, I did an executive MBA program at Pepperdine University here in California. And that prepared me to go from what I consider the minor leagues to the major leagues. And, you know, once I became a director of marketing, I set my sights on running a, a sizable marketing organization on a path to becoming a CMO. Wow. I mean, you've you've had several stops as CMO. I mean, I was checking out your LinkedIn. I mean, you know, it looks like it rat low. So you were you have a lot of marketing leadership roles. Really cool. It looks like Front Bridge Technologies acquired by Microsoft. Uh, then you went into be vice president FileNet slash IBM. Then you you had you led a, a quite a few organizations through acquisition, which I, I love this. You have vice president of marketing at Guidance Software acquired by OpenText. Uh, then you went over to Pega Systems. Then you went over um, to Kofax, acquired three times. So a lot of stops along the way. And, you know, there's not a ton of CMOs that I've had a chance to connect with that have gone through that's helped organizations go through that many acquisitions. And that's a different perspective. So um, can you kind of walk us through high level different stops and what you learned along the way? Because there's there's a really clear skill set you have taking companies through acquisition as a marketing leader. And that is pretty awesome. Well, thanks, Jeremy. I think I've been uh, very fortunate. I do try to pick opportunities based on a wide range of criteria we could get into later. But to answer the, the question, so, you know, at Pega, I was the CMO there for three and a half years. And, you know, we grew from 200 million thereabouts to over 500 million. They're over a billion dollars today. And uh, it's a public company. And when I got to Kofax in 2013, um, you know, company was public on the London Stock Exchange, but we, we did a public offering on uh, NASDAQ. And we started acquiring a number of companies. So as I reflect on it, I've been acquired seven times and I've been part of acquiring or merging with 17 companies. So you come up with a playbook when you've done things over and over again, like, you know, how do you integrate as you're part of a larger organization? Uh, we were acquired at Kofax, uh, became uh, enterprise software division. So we went from 300 million to 700 million. And I had to figure out a way how to blend those three organizations, one based in California, one 
based in Kansas, one based in Europe, and how to blend those cultures and teams so that we could elevate our contribution to, to business. So I've just been very fortunate and had these opportunities. And uh, you know, we've acquired a couple companies so far at Inburst. We may acquire more as, as time goes on. And so there's a, a process you go through that makes sure you get the best of that company and you, you, you can integrate not just their technology, but find ways for their people to thrive as well. Can you talk a little bit about the playbook, high level, just some of the things that, that have become table stakes for you now as a marketing leader, either acquiring other companies or going through acquisition? What are some of the things you're thinking now because you've, you've done it so many times? Right. Well, I think I'll just give you an example of what we did when we merged uh, three companies to become enterprise uh, software division of Lexmark. So we had Kofax, uh, Perceptive, and Readsoft based out of uh, Sweden. And... Let's just assume that the acquiring company's done all the due diligence, they've looked at the IP, they've looked at the potential liabilities, and they've made an investment decision. Uh, while I do contribute to that as one of the, uh, the officers of the company, I, ultimately that's going to be decided by the lead investor, or the, the board, the CEO. So you know, once that's been consummated, now the game begins. Now how do we make sure this thing works? There's always these spreadsheets that are done that are like the synergies. And, you know, that nobody can predict the future and know exactly how that'll turn out. But what I did uh, when we merged those three areas, I really found when I went and visited the team in Kansas City, there was a lot of trepidation that we were going to be California centric. Seven of the nine executives on the leadership team were based out of the Kofax heritage. And so, it was a real fear that their innovation, their ideas would not see the light. So part of the playbook is we created a, we did a best practice workshop. So instead of saying it's the Kofax way, I said, well, what are we doing with Perceptives that's working? What are we doing at Readsoft that's working? And so they did a couple of things. First of all, it made people feel they were part of the solution. They weren't being told what to do. I learned that lesson a long time ago when I visited Europe and came back to the U.S. and they nodded ahead and agreed and went ahead and did something different. So you need to bring, bring people along the journey. Um, and so we created the best practice going forward that everybody could adopt. They could see their handprint on shaping the future. And so I think that's really one of the fundamental parts of the playbook. The other thing, which is just as important, is making sure from a leadership perspective, it doesn't feel like it's all coming from whatever the perceived headquarters is. So I blended the teams. I had a leader who was a high potential person in uh the organization Kansas City managed people in Irvine. It had somebody in Europe manage people in the U.S. Uh, over digital marketing because that's a global thing. It doesn't matter where you live for digital. And I found that helped people not only grow their careers, but made the overall organization feel like there was a healthy balance. There wasn't just, you know, one perspective ruling the day. Mm. Where where was this intersection for you of, of kind of you know, graduating from an individual contributor marketer to a marketing leader. What what point of the of your path was that? And then what are some of the lessons you've learned now being in marketing leadership at so many places, just high level things you've taken, but take us to that point of, you know, before you stepped into leadership and what was happening in your life at that time and what that was like. Well, actually, it's a great uh, question because I remember it distinctly. It's a few gray hairs ago, <laughs> but uh, I had been a really strong individual contributor and I had impressed one of the sales directors who recommended me to a VP of marketing and they had an open role and I had cut my teeth in product marketing and ultimately demand gen and all things that you know, modern marketers, you know, full stack marketers, whatever term you want to use, have to be uh, uh, fluent in. And I'm interviewing with the VP of marketing and he's, he's talking to me and he's saying, well, I'm not really sure whether uh, you're ready for director over several folks, a product marketing or just senior product marketing manager. And I, in, in my own head, I was talking to one of my mentors, like, I'm not sure I'm ready for it myself. And he said, you know what? The work will teach you. You know, if you can learn from me your mistakes, you'll figure it out. And I'll tell you, the first couple of weeks were rocky, but like two months into it, I sort of said, why did I ever question myself? So I think once you get on that you know, leadership path and you're managing others, in fact, my first week, uh, one of the individuals came to me and, and said, look, I, if you don't promote me to, from manager to senior manager, I'm quitting. And it's like, what? So I had to deal with that. Actually, I came up with a creative approach and said, look, 
why don't we come up with a plan? And if you do this, if I don't promote you, they'll think I'm a fool. And I did promote him, and he did those things, but at least I held them off. Uh, you know, it's like, why? Well, I just got here. Why are you quitting? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Is there is there a particular marketing strategy that you're very proud of that you can share with us? Uh, I, you know, I'm particularly proud that I've often helped the senior leadership team, you know, think through how we uh, set quarterly objectives and how we prioritize when you're in complex businesses and you serve multiple segments and constituents um, and you're in very dynamic markets like we are at Imburse, it's easy to be distracted by the next shiny object. Let's go here. Let's go there. And I always feel like let's make sure we fulfill the, the key objectives first. And so my team uh, has, over the last several stops, uh, we, we have quarterly focus. So it could be our top 10 priorities or our top three objectives. And that's a, a guiding light that, you know, while I do like all, I think savvy CMOs carve out a portion of the budget to experiment and to, to try things that we hadn't thought of as we entered the year, the quarter, uh, do try to stick to the priorities so we can make sure we deliver on those. Uh, otherwise it could be real easy to, you know, be a, a jack of all trades and master of none and you know, end up where you fall short almost everywhere. Hmm. You you've got, you have a lot of W's in terms of you know leading organizations through a lot of growth. I mean, it's it's very impressive and and very inspiring. What does that do for your relationship with like growth and like how fast you can make things happen? Right? There's a velocity of growth that that I think the modern day marketer there's a relationship with that. And I and I you know my judgment of a of an executive like you is that, I mean, you've had this experience and this perspective and, you know, you can make things happen in a lot of ways. And so what is, what is that balance like for you now? How do you view predictable growth? How do you, how do you dance with predictable growth? Well, Jeremy, that's a, another, you know, outstanding uh, area to, to explore. I, I think that having seen growth, as you noted in various markets, various segments, I know how to scale. So I know how to scale people, teams, processes, programs, and to apply the just right resource. I'll, I love using this example because I literally, we decided last year as an executive team that we were missing an opportunity. We saw a lot of competitors who I will not name, uh, growing really fast, getting valuations and funding. And Mary thought we had at least as good, maybe a better solution. So I actually uh, did not have anybody on the team. Well, I knew how to do it. I knew that I couldn't personally scale the business. So I found someone who had that expertise in SMB and high velocity marketing. And I said, look, it's just going to be you in January 1. But by the time we get to Q2, you'll have three people. He's got three people now. And uh, we, we now are building a model that how we if we make this year's plan and we get ahead of it, how do we put more into it? in a responsible manner. And so that's part of it. You have to have a business model, a, a business case, a rationale that shows you're gonna get a return. Uh, I've always felt that I'm a steward of the company's money, their investment as if it's my own, and I wouldn't want to spend it foolishly. So we, I always insist on, we've got to have a hypothesis. In fact, way back before COVID, I was probably, one of the things I was known for is going in uh, the organizations and reducing the events budget, not because there's anything intrinsically wrong with events. I, I started our dialogue by saying how important it is to meet people in person because I wanted to make sure we had the ROI of everything. So if you're going to spend $10,000 on a, you know, a regional show, how many leads, what's the cost per lead, what's the conversion, how much bookings will we get? I remember sitting down early in my Imburse journey with uh, one of my marketing managers who was really proud about, you know, how many leads they got. I said, well, well how much did we close? Well, what do you mean? Well, then we know whether we made a good investment or not. And so that just kind of changed the mindset of thinking about the ROI of everything. And that really helps you scale faster because if you're getting, you know, three, four, five to one ROI, I mean, I can go to the board and say, look, another million dollars, I can give you 5 million. How does that sound? What would you say around sales and marketing alignment, especially these days? Again, you know, reflecting on your perspective, you have a ton of amazing experience how do, how do you view sales and marketing alignment? What are some of the best practices you found work really well to align sales and marketing in 2022? Yeah, I, I, I learned this lesson. I, I love, uh, Jeremy, the way you look at it. Where's the catalyst? 
I was at a company where I was number two, kind of, you know, getting ready to, to assume the, the top marketing exec role. Finger pointing was an art. <laughs> it was sales and marketing crossways. And I just thought that was nonsense. And so when I got to Pega, I said, you know, I want to sit next to the CRO. <laughs> I want to sit next to the head of sales. And I did the same thing at Kofax, you know, so Leon Treffler at Pega, Howard Drattler at Kofax. Uh, we're in a bunch of offices in Burst, so I couldn't quite do that. <clears throat> but my point is, we either succeed or fall short together. And, you know, I feel that one of the key ways to ensure that happens is not just the CMO and the CRO are aligned, but at each connection point. So they're aligned at the leadership level, at the manager level, feet on the street, in region. Uh, you can't just sit at some headquarters and say, this is how it's going to work in uh, Dock region or in Southern Europe or, you know, in Canada. You, you don't know. You've got to make sure it's sales and marketing find a way to do it together. And uh, my team adopts and embraces that wholeheartedly. Uh, but I think early on, you know, I, I did inherit a situation where the marketer said, well, we've delivered the leads, so we're good. I said, well, we didn't make the quarter, so we're not good. <laughs> and that was an educational process. It, it's, I love that. I mean, it's, it's you know, building trust and aligning strategically with the CRO is so key these days. I've talked to a few organizations, Grant, where the BDRs are rolling up to marketing versus sales. Is that the case at Inverse or is it still BDR up to sales? Well, you know, what's interesting is I started the BDR organization at Peg and I've managed BDRs up to, you know, 40, 50 folks for a decade. And when I got to Bursa Sierra, I said, you know, I've never managed BDRs. A lot of them get promoted into sales. How about if I do it? And I said, fine. I said, but the key thing is you hit on it, Jeremy, is alignment. I said, as long as we're aligned that BDRs will report on, hey, what campaigns are working? What's breaking through? What's resonating? Uh, you know, we, we found in COVID virtualizing the financial operations. Think about it. You have all these folks working remotely. They're incurring expenses, home office expenses. How do you manage that? We help companies manage the virtual operation. Uh, you know, if checks are if checks are coming into an office, nobody's there. You know, how do you cash them or how do you pay bills you don't get? Well, you can do that through uh, electronic fund transfer through the automation we provide with our invoice automation solution. So uh, you have to find uh, a way to to really adapt to the environment. Uh, and, you know, I don't mind that the BDRs report to sales. I, I have a monthly, sometimes actually a bi-weekly connection with the head of it. And I said, well, hey, what's working? And, and all again, the, if there's alignment there, I tell people, don't get hup, hung up reporting, right? If we're misaligned, you can have people within your own department fighting each other. So right. you don't want that to happen either. Yeah. Um, in, a, in a previous podcast, you, you mentioned being a competitive tennis player. Um, have you always been competitive? Yeah, I, th I think so. I, uh, you, you love catalyst. I, I remember a baseball game. I was a pitcher. I lost and my mom said, Hey, it's just a game. And I said, not to me. <laughs> so, you know, I've got a, like 20 trophies on my shelf back that I'm still competing. I just came back from the UST nationals, you know, at the 4.0 level. Oh, that's uh, awesome. I think it's a decent level, you know, opens are like above five and a half. And so, but it's fun and it keeps you healthy and young. And, uh, but I think, you know, you have to be careful. You, you, you also have to be empathetic. Um, I've learned over time, I, I probably wasn't the best listener earlier in my career. I thought I knew a better way to make sure you bring people along the journey and you don't run people over. We, we've done a lot of work on team dynamics, uh, whether, you know, you're a fan of DISC or DISC or mm -hmm. Myers-Briggs. Yep. There's different personality types and I may be extroverted, but I've got some really talented introverts. I don't want to make sure they can do their best work while they're at Inverse. Do you, do you think a competitive nature is always productive or does it ever cause challenges in terms of like the, in the business, business sense? Oh, I think it can. I think, you know, if you're not inclusive and, you know, it's my way or the highway or all types of things that I, I love the drive to win, to excel, to be number one, but it has to be moderated by, you know, uh, humanizing work and being, uh, you know, authentic with your staff and uh, being compassionate. And, and uh, you know, one of our, we have a, we call the see it core values. I, uh, executive team, we, we came up with sincerity, empathy, empowerment, individuality, and teamwork. And we really, they're all important, but, you know, you have to be empathetic, especially in these times. And if you're just like competitive, you know, it's not going to work. 
So I, I think that you have to moderate the competitive nature to some extent because uh, you could just leave people behind and that's not what you want to do. The idea of the kind of the modern day marketer these days, I'd love your perspective on this. It's It appears to me that a lot of really good modern day CMOs are they've got this right brain, left brain thing. They, they understand the art and the science of marketing. As I rewind the clock a decade or more, you can see where there were CMOs that were, had really strong on one side or the other, but didn't necessarily have both. It seems like today you got to have to be able to dance with both. What's your, what's your take on that? A hundred percent agree. If you go back, as you said, Jeremy, a decade or so ago, you know, some people might've come up through product as I do, they might have come up through brand. There was no one way. And I've always felt that you have to have that balance. And that's what I, continues to excite me about technology marketing because it's an art and a science. You know, I, I tried to edit every creative campaign. I came up with our Embrace It campaign to verbify it. Our agency brought it to life. Our creative team made it uh, the campaign sing. I started with the, the, the idea. Now we're measuring it uh, because if it doesn't work, that I don't want to continue doing it. And so um, I don't think there's any other way. In fact, I'm part of a few, you know, CMO groups and CMO huddle in particular. And as I listen to my peers on this monthly basis, we dialogue about the pressing issues and challenges we all face and opportunities. Um, you know, these are thoughtful CMOs that, you know, uh, manage to have breakthrough creative uh, and compelling ideas, as well as, you know, manage the business through 25 KPIs. So, You've got to have that uh, balance to really operate successfully as a CMO today. Uh, in in a in a question and answer section on on your company bio on the Ember site says that you you mention about dreaming of being a film director when you were a child and, and your bio you went on to say. In my chosen profession, I make very few short movie, movies, but the storytelling craft is as important for success in business as in Hollywood, which I agree. Uh, first, quick aside question, who's your favorite director and why? Well, Christopher Nolan. Um, okay. You know, it helps that I like uh, sci-fi and, and uh, Batman thrillers. And, you know, I was mesmerized by Memento from the first view. Oh, it's a great and one. And my most recent one, Tenet, I've seen that three times. You've got to see it more than once because... I don't know who could, even the director, how would you understand that film the first time through time travel? Oh. But uh, he's just brilliant at uh, the craft. I so love I that. I admire that, obviously. I'll, yeah. Well, you, those are, you name some of my favorites right off the bat. So I'm like, yep, tin it for the win all the way. Um, it, so in thinking of yourself as an, you know, a storyteller in your marketing career, what what is your unique vision and manner of telling stories? To me, it starts with the audience in mind. And so you can create anything in the world. Uh, it's a saying I heard earlier in my career, imagination rules the world. And I, I think, you know, creativity uh, is a real differentiator. And not being satisfied with the status quo is a great driver for, you know, thinking different, uh, which you know, Steve Jobs obviously was brilliant at, right? And so for me, it's trying to connect on a human level in authentic fashion something that's meaningful to, to the audience. Um, I learned, even though I started in a pretty technical role in product management, product marketing, that, you know, what it does is important. What it means is more important. And so uh, talking about the benefit, uh, the outcomes, I mean, customers want outcomes. They don't want your technology. They want to solve a problem. And if you can describe the outcomes, the future state, uh, the goodness of, being a partner with your company and you're adopting your solution, then I think you're a long ways to connecting. And then, you know, just the, the, the idea. So, uh, you know, the, the Embursa idea, um, we just launched uh, LinkedIn banners and mine has Embursa on it. We have other banners uh, that show the brand uh, colors and, you know, the, uh, the see it values. But that to me was, you know, the one I wanted to pick because I really think there's a better way of doing things you know, don't just invoice it and burst it, you know, find a better way, a simpler way. We want to take the work out of work and humanize it. So you have time back to what matters most. Are you doing anything experimental on the marketing side? Are you, can I talk about the R and D stuff at all in terms of marketing? Are you trying anything kind of out there? If so, what can you share? Well, we've been adopting new technologies and platforms since I joined in burst a little over two and a half years ago. Uh, we're probably 
not using AI like you know some companies are. We 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 uh, we're doing a little bit of a machine learning and uh, you know applying some more sophisticated al- learning algorithms to what we do. But it's it's more of you know experimenting with. Uh, various tactics and channels, like for example, on the inverse spend, uh, we found that you know we can grow pretty fast. But what if we connect to an affiliate channel that has eight hundred, uh, you know, partners, and we could activate those partners versus trying to activate a partner one by one on our own? That would take so much longer and so much more effort. So I think you can experiment in. Uh, I, I consider marketing has several levers, uh, and 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 growth has several levers. Product-led growth is a pretty common one in SaaS companies like us today, but you can grow geographically, you can grow within your customers, and you can innovate in how you deliver products. We have a vision that we want to eliminate the expense report in the future. So, you know, it just knows that if you went to this restaurant, they see the calendar, I've got Jeremy booked for lunch, and we're trying to develop business together. That's a legitimate business expense. Why do I have to, you know, submit a receipt? It's within the parameters of a fifty dollar lunch. No alcohol was involved midday, therefore we're good to go. So I think those are the types of things that we want to be able to seize up. I will tell you, I'm super excited about a product we just launched called Inverse Go. We think we're going to make not just improve the work experience, the travel experience. So I was on a trip to Barcelona. We had a a meeting with our hundred plus folks in Europe. And I'm flying American, changing uh, planes at Heathrow, and I'm on British Airways, and I want to know what terminal to go to, what gate. American didn't know. Uh, British Airways didn't know. I'm not criticizing their apps, but Go knew because we've got a connection, uh, and we've, we've built that integration. And so I could calmly walk to the next gate and make my flight, even though I'm groggy flying from California. And so... Uh, Things like in Go that improve the travel experience. So when you come back, it used to be a badge of honor to be a road warrior. I don't think it is anymore, right? You want to be a balanced human being and not be exhausted for three days when you re- return. Mm. I'd love to just get your thoughts on this gl- global marketing, right? Because you're not just marketing in the U.S., you're marketing globally. What can you share around that in terms of is it decentralized where you've got teams in other countries and you really kind of focus more centralized and how does that relate with localization and personalization and all these different countries? Like how do you view just global marketing at scale since you've been in that for a while? You know, early on, I saw where it failed. If you just like, here's the global campaign. Now Europe, go implement it. Now Asia pack, go implement it. And, um, you know, early on I did a, a global brand uh, audit and, you know, just found that, you know, we had wide uh, range of, uh, you know, inconsistent or uh, varying expressions. We wanted to centralize that, but we, we, we certainly couldn't centralize all the markets. So I try to empower each region, whether it's, a, you know, the head of marketing for, I have a head of EMEA marketing, or, you know, could be the head of marketing for, for APAC that, you know, leverage the campaigns, take advantage of the of the artifacts. I would just say for global marketing, make sure you empower the teams with the resources and the flexibility to adapt what they need to succeed in their markets. As you say, taking into account, Jeremy, the language, the culture, the audiences they're trying to connect with. Um, All right, let's do the lightning round, Grant. Um, This has been an exceptional conversation, really an honor, I mean, to connect with someone like you and just again, perspective and experience, it just says a lot. So thank you for being here. Let's get into the lightning round, you ready? Sure. Okay, all right, so before we get into this, gotta give a nod to our sponsor, Salesforce. When companies think about marketing and engagement and the world's number one CRM, Think Salesforce. If you want to learn more, head over to salesforce.com forward slash marketing. We've got Grant Johnson, CMO of Embers, in the house virtually. First question, lightning round. Grant, what are you betting on for the future? And it could be personal or professional. You know, I'm betting on having uh, an engaged team uh, that uh, has locked arms and is moving forward together towards a agreed upon destination. Um, and I think, you know, people will ultimately make the difference on team and company level. Okay. So hypothetically, you rolled into Embers tomorrow and the entire marketing team is gone. 
they quit, whatever it is. You have to build the marketing team now from scratch. What role are you hiring first and why? Well, uh, that's a tough one. What <laughs> role? <laughs> I would hire demand gen first. I mean, okay. I, I've got 97 stats I share with the CEO, but uh, pipelines, number one, two, and three. Okay. What impresses you? I think um, character impresses me the most. You know, they're... Tough times don't last. Tough people do. It's just, you know, having integrity, um, you know, force of will, empathy, as I'd mentioned earlier in the podcast. Uh, just, you know, I, I learned early in my career that, you know, everybody uh, has to get dressed in the morning. And so I was, you know, interact with generals and I could have been intimidated, but they're all people. And they and most of them, try, you know, they teach me with respect. Uh, they treat me with respect. So I try to treat everybody with respect. And that's character in a word. Mm, I love it. If you had access to a time machine, where and when would you go? I suppose uh, I would go to the future where John Lennon's vision came true. It's just so awful what's happening in Ukraine. Mm. We just got to find a way to you know, get Russia out and, and uh, get back to a planet where we can all coexist peacefully. I mm, uh, appreciate that. What, what is success for you these days? Now success is two parts. On a professional level, it's it's helping the company achieve its goals. That's my job, but also helping the individuals uh, get to their next level. I've been very fortunate, as we've discussed, and you know, uh, achieving the goal I had in, in repeated fashion as uh, as a CMO, and so helping them achieve. And then, you know, I've got three kids: uh, two early stage of college, one late stage of high school, and and so you know, helping them along their path. Everybody has to, you know, figure out their own path. So. My role is the guide. I don't know what's going to be right for them. I just want to help them make good decisions. Mm. What is your favorite app on your phone? My uh, my tennis scheduler. Because <laughs> I, I had a feeling I, you were going to say I something about to tennis. Play a, you know, I, like who's looking to, for a match? I got to play a couple times. We keep my you know competitive edge. Okay. And uh, you know, it's fun. I just post where I want to play, and somebody responds, or they'll text me, and there you go. What app is that? It's called Global Tennis Network. It's just there's uh, I'm in cool. Southern California, Irvine, and it, I don't know if it's truly global, but we got a hundred cool. players, and yeah, you post, you play. Ah, oh, that's nice. Okay, um, what's a skill you believe everyone should have? Licity. Ah, that's my that's my favorite answer of all time, right there. That's the one. Um, if you could if you could effortlessly pick up a new skill in an instant, what would it be? A good serve. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> My son hits a hundred mile hour serve. I don't. He didn't get it from me. I, I, I haven't given up. Maybe I'll learn from him. <laughs> That's great. Um, what is one thing that you would like to do this year that you've never done before? Well, I actually, I'd like to hella ski. It's on my bucket list. I I just Ooh. came back. I can ski expert runs. I've never done that. So I've got a few buddies that hopefully it's on their bucket list. We'll we'll go to Banff or somewhere. I love that. I'm a big skier. I have not quite graduated to the hel heli ski level, unless you can drop me off on a nice blue green, then I'll I'll be your man. But uh, that's possible. That's awesome. Well, Grant Johnson, thank you so much for being here. This has truly been an exceptional conversation. Congratulations to you and the whole team at Imburse. I know this is definitely not the end, uh, but thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Jeremy, it's been my pleasure. I really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, fantastic hosting and look forward to your future success. Thank you, sir. Thank you again to Salesforce for making this show possible. If you want to learn more about Salesforce, go to salesforce.com forward slash marketing.